Futurama is full of wacky adventures and fun ideas for what the future of Earth might be like. But with all the crazy things that could happen, fans have speculated on what the true meaning and intentions behind some of our favorite sci-fi heroes. Let's take a look at some of the most popular theories and figure out which ones seem legit. Hey guys, I'm Brad with Wicked Binge, and this is Futurama Fan Theories, BS to Truth Bombs. First, let's get the theories out of the way that have been debunked. These theories have so many holes they can't be true. They lack evidence, or they've been confirmed false by the creators. These theories are bull****. Monsanto bankrolled Futurama When Leela grows tentacles and her search for a cure leads her to Mom, she learns that Mom was in charge of a segment of her monopoly known as Monsanto that genetically modified food. Mom brags about how her food can feed large populations as well as earn her a lot of money as she takes over the market, showing off the various types of food they've created. You've got some freaky DNA and I want to see what's in your genes. While we can see why some people would be upset about Monsanto being shown anywhere near a good light, we have to label this idea as BS for one reason. Mom has already been established as evil and money-hungry. She's the type of person who doesn't care about the benefit of humanity. After all, in one of her earliest episodes, she encourages the robots to kill all of humanity because she had a broken heart. This isn't a woman that's going to be shown in a good light. She knows how to play the game. Hermes is a secret agent. This idea states that Hermes is working undercover at Planet Express in order to log all the illegal activity and report it. Once the crew was thrown in prison, the government would be able to seize all of the professor's inventions and modify what they could for intelligence and warfare. This seems like a good theory on the surface, but we want to point out that much of the illegal activity is done by Hermes as he tries to save the business money. He tries registering the staff as slaves, he slashes their wages to save cost to the point where they barely make anything. We we'll start by slashing salaries, and this time I mean really slashing. He engages in workplace violence and hostility when it comes to Zoidberg. If Hermes was looking to take down the staff, he would be going down with them, and that doesn't sound like something he would be interested in. The Hypno Toad is Bart's Toad. While this would be a great link between the two shows, we feel that even in a show like Futurama, this is highly unlikely. The two shows have had several crossovers, and while it's not explained, it's theorized that the two are different realms of reality, while still existing as shows in each other's dimension. Homer Simpson must be eliminated immediately. After Bart frees a pet toad named Bart Jr. in Australia, it leads to a population increase in toads that devours plant life and terrorizes the people. And since we don't know much about Hypnotoad or how it came to be, it makes sense that fans would link the two things together. But between different dimensions and not having a solid idea as to how Bart Jr. would have survived that long, let alone mutate the hypnotized people, we have to dismiss this idea until more evidence can be presented. There's already a slim chance that Hypnotoad is one of Bart Jr.'s offspring, but the two being the same is astronomical. Glory to the Hypnotoad! Moving on from the BS, these theories still have a lot of problems, though not enough to say they're completely debunked. These theories are full of holes. Zap was frozen. Reddit user Sandman underscore Ivan suggests that Zap Brannigan is not a man of the year 3000 like we once believed. They point out Zap is never shown to have any family, always surrounded by military and higher officials. And when Zap was homeless, he had no one to turn to and took Kif down with him so he wouldn't have to suffer alone. He's ignorant of the various races of aliens and their customs, often insulting them without realizing it, like when he was eating the Omicronian young during a meeting with the Omicronian leaders. And the user points out that some of Zap's titles and accomplishments sound like fake names he made up. There isn't a lot that goes against this theory, save for the fact that we have a birth year for him and much of the official stuff in the future sounds fake. Plus, Zap doesn't seem like a guy who cares to research the aliens he's fighting or forming alliances with. Anti-aging The Reddit user that posted this theory has deleted their account, but thankfully this post remained. 
The theory is that dark matter and the radiation that comes from it causes those exposed to either slow in the aging process or stop aging completely. They point out that Professor Farnsworth utilizes dark matter for the ship and that the crew appears to stay the same age. They also say that when Leela takes over Planet Express and uses different ships, changing things from Farnsworth's plan, she and the rest of the remaining crew have aged drastically. And finally, the Neblonians being near immortal, which would make sense if dark matter had anti-aging qualities. Since they create it, it would be a part of their system. However, we have to give this a low ranking. Though it is interesting, we have to point out that no one else ages either, even when away from excessive dark matter usage. This is a cartoon. Matt Groening has made a few jokes in his content that he's aware he hasn't aged his characters much. For example, when Bart is asked how long Nelson has been bullying him, Bart replies, 20 years. The end of the show is a what if. This was presented by the YouTube channel Collider back in July of 2019, and it is an interesting one. The title says it all. The entire remaining part of the series is simply being a what if question. With Fry being such a regular guy, it would make sense that the what if machine would play out a future where he would suddenly become one of the most important people in the universe, like it did with the other scenarios. But the speculation only supplies that Fry would ask how he can get Leela to fall for him, or how they could end up together. So it doesn't account for the other events that take place outside of Leela and Fry's relationship. This thing isn't worth the gold it's made of. The future is Fry's coma dream. This suggests that Fry never froze, but instead fell into a coma, where he imagined all the events of the year 3000. This has some pros and cons, with the main argument being that the events of the future were so ridiculous that they must have been the product of Fry's imagination. After all, Fry was a delivery boy, and him becoming the center of this grand master plan seems unlikely. Much of what we see in the future, Fry recalls as fantasizing about in his childhood and young adulthood being able to walk on the moon, the designs of the Planet Express ship, being able to be a hero and having a love interest that made him want to be a better person, plus the appearances of famous people that Fry would have grown up learning about or wanting to meet, such as the Beastie Boys or Leonard Nimoy. After all, why else would the people of the year 3000 elect Richard Nixon for president of the entire planet? With that said, we're now into the middle category, where we may stumble into some truth. Maybe. These theories are the possible. Infinite Scruffies Scruffy the janitor is one of the most quoted side characters in all of Matt Groening's shows and is as insightful as he is lazy. But Scruffy suffers as many injuries as the main protagonist. A broken spine, for instance, should keep someone down for a while, but the janitor is soon after perfectly fine. If you can't see me, is that private? It's not crazy to think that the professor cloned his favorite janitor over and over so he wouldn't lose a valued employee, but there are a lot of advancements in medicine that would also make it believable that Scruffy is able to be healed on site by either Zoidberg or Farnsworth. Why suicide booths are so popular It's nearly impossible for people to die in the show, and no, we don't just mean Bender or the other robots. With the Planet Express crew, people survive dismemberment, being crushed, being impaled. Even Hermes, who sold his body in exchange for becoming a robot, was able to be given his old body back and healed with Zoidbird's mending. And it's not unusual for people to live at a very old age like Professor Farnsworth. There were so many that people had to be taken to the near Death Star where they would reside in a weird virtual reality and produce power. Considering how much variety there is to die in a suicide booth, it's easy to see that those drastic measures are needed in order to be sure a person actually dies. America's favorite suicide booth since 2008. Farnsworth is a wizard. As seen with Matt Groening's other show, Disenchantment, the line between science and magic can be blurry. In Futurama, the inventions Farnsworth creates are unable to be explained, with him declaring it was impossible to do so. A time-traveling machine! But at the same time, he was able to do things other scientists were not. For example, making the universe move around the ship rather than the ship moving within the universe. It's possible that the professor is using magic without even realizing it. And if that's the case, he's not the only one. 
Farnsworth states that scientists were able to increase the speed of light, and Leela explains that older people were able to be used to generate power in spite of all the criticisms the idea faced. On the other end of the spectrum, you have men like Ogden Wernstrom that stick to more specific ideas concerning science which gains him more respect in the scientific community. But we place Professor Farnsworth's title of wizard as a maybe, since it's more likely that magic was brushed off as a scientific invention. There's one episode of The Simpsons that implies this idea, when Marge takes a picture and shakes it until it becomes a cake, making a comment about scientists inventing magic. Zap Brannigan has PTSD. This is also widely accepted and is summarized well by Reddit user Bingram. When we meet Zap in Season 1, he's established as a decorated war hero. Wanting to brag about his accomplishments, he talks about the victory that made him famous, saving the Octillion system. Show them the medal I won. Zap describes his strategy in simple terms, saying he used the fact that robots have a kill limit to make them wear down by sacrificing countless men and sending them off to be slaughtered. Zap is clearly not stable. He's manipulative and vain, and only uses his intellect to get something he wants. If there's a way to take the easy way out, he's gonna do it. He'll surrender if it means it'll save his life. In a later episode, Zap tries to use his men again, sending Bender as a disguise bomb to explode a planet and giving the soldiers barely any training, which raises the question as to whether Zap went off the deep end after being forced to deal with the trauma of his actions, or if he sent his men to die because he was already suffering from a condition. The crew always recovers. Reddit user Obvious Trollway presents the idea that the reason the crew is able to recover every ridiculous adventure and peril boils down to one thing. Professor Farnsworth's ability to clone. Cloning is wrong. It's wrong, I say. He's cloned himself to produce an heir, and that he had the ability to bring back Fry's dog Seymour through cloning, despite the dog being fossilized. So he has the technology and is able to work with even the smallest bit of DNA. It isn't outlandish that the crew has met their end, and in order to avoid being punished by authorities for his neglect, Farnsworth cloned the crew and continued business as normal. It also helps to explain why he doesn't care about sending them off on countless dangerous missions. After all, why worry when he can always make more? For those in the comments that may ask, well, why didn't Farnsworth do this with his old crew and clone them? We wanted to add our own addition to this theory. Fry and Leela were the only known humans of that age to be without a career chip that wouldn't be tracked. That would explain why Farnsworth sent them and Bender for the majority of the missions. These next conspiracies make a lot of sense. In fact, we think they're more likely to be true than not. These theories are probable. Post-Scarcity University This was posted on Screen Rant in 2018 and suggests that the reason Earth and so many other planets have an issue with trash is because needs are produced so rapidly that they're able to be wasteful with it. The people of the year 3000 rely on robots and other methods to simplify their lives, which would lead to products being cheap, though not free which means people were able to use their money in other ways. This would explain why so much money is being given to near useless products, such as giving fish robotic legs to fetch sticks and a telescope that can detect smells across the universe. How else can you explain a super telescope in the middle of nowhere solely being used to find the location of a god? And the amount of money needed for maintaining the military power granted to Zap Brannigan would be a large sum of cash. This also leads to many other things, such as seeing those that live out their lives in a virtual fantasy or false reality, which is why the internet was built up to be some place that people are able to play in and explore in a more immersive fashion. This also plays into how people choosing to pursue relationships with robots became a fear for enough of the population that cautionary PSAs were made on the subject. After all, with little to no need to work, why not take the easy way out in relationships too? But with too small of a populace, there's not as many people to consume the released products, and things fall further into disarray. But if people have no need to work, why do they? I'm a delivery boy! While the idea suggests they do so for personal fulfillment, to either have fun or to prove something to themselves, this would bring into question why career chips exist if people don't need to work at all. And if people didn't need to work, why would Amy be homeless if her parents weren't able to pay her rent? There's a lot of questions that come up with that area. And if people are able to get everything so cheap, why is it that people are still making slave wages or being bled dry by people like mom? 
Well, that's less of a question and more of an accusation. Fry Straits leads to Farnsworth's success more than he thinks. This theory was given on Reddit and goes into detail that Fry has been an influence not only on the professor, but on the show due to his imagination. When the professor clones a son for himself, Farnsworth explains that the reasons his inventions are able to be created, despite coming across as impossible, was because he was able to imagine how they would work. Farnsworth was quoted as saying, nothing is impossible as long as you can imagine it, while also making the point that giving a clear explanation was the only difficult part. Nothing is impossible, not if you can imagine it. The user makes the point that Fry had influenced not only his family, but numerous people. Fry's dream to be the first man on Mars lived on in his nephew, who had been given the same name. Fry had been curious as a child and wanted to create a project to see how the cold flu would survive in space. Though his project had failed, it led to another student using Fry's idea that benefited the people of the year 3000. The professor has been quick to dismiss Fry multiple times, denouncing Fry for his simple ways, but there have been more than a few episodes where Fry's solutions and less than genius abilities have managed to save the day, such as when the Nebulons used him to get rid of the brains, and when his love of Slurm led to him being the light source they used to get through a dense fog. The Other and the Truth About Bender These theories were posted on Reddit, and they discuss how Bender came about ruling the universe and how Fry and Leela play into it. Bender has long been known for his mantra of, kill all humans. So it wasn't too surprising to hear that Bender had ambitions of taking over. Bender had already risen to power on an Egyptian-like planet, forcing the people to make a statue of him and had been a god to a small race of beings he picked up in an asteroid field. It's high time I laid down a few commandments. You got a chisel? When Chris Travers reveals he came back from the future to stop Bender from rising as a tyrannical ruler, Bender's response is that they can't change the future. But how could he be so sure? The user made a few points in their theory. The first is the events from Bender's big score. Bender uses a code found on Fry's butt to be able to travel through space and time, using it to get riches and valuables. By the end of the adventure, Bender places the tattoo on Fry so that the events make sense. The second point comes up when Bender becomes overclocked and gains super intelligence, reaching the point that Bender is able to bend reality to his will and is able to see into the future. And before he's put back into his factory settings, he's able to write down a variety of useful information, such as the answers to the universe and how Fry and Leela's relationship would work out. It isn't hard to think that while Bender had these abilities, he was able to bend things to work out so he became ruler of the universe and that Fry and Leela were meant to work alongside him. After all, Bender admitted that Fry was the one human he excluded when talking about destroying all of humanity. And though Bender didn't include Leela in that sentiment, Bender cares about her, being forced to attempt to kill her when he becomes the werecar. Everyone loves killing people, but I don't want to hurt my friend. So the idea presented also suggests that Leela was meant to be spared by Bender. When Nibbler recruits Fry, he refers to Leela as the other and states he learned of Fry and Leela through an ancient text. Considering Bender was able to go anywhere in time and space that he wanted, it would make sense that he would raise the two most important people to him to such a level of importance that they were almost worshipped and seen as saviors. Finally, we've reached the truth. People have blown the whistle on these theories with such compelling evidence that it must be true or a creator confirmed it. These theories are the truth bombs. The U.S. took over the world. This should be clear enough by the flag that's used through the show and the fact that the president of the world is housed in the White House, but we wanted to make it clear. Fans have pointed out that the Earth soon becomes modeled after the U.S. Every location on Earth follow America's same need for consumerism and industry, not to mention all the war tactics used by Zap and the other soldiers follow the same idea of policing and domination that has become a trend throughout U.S. history. There's also an obsession with American pop culture and celebrities, with many of the sex robots being modeled after American actors or pop stars. Would you like to take a moment to register me? The theory also takes it a step further, stating that this likely occurred due to the involvement and success of the very people that insisted Fry become frozen, consisting of Michelle Nichols, Gary Gygax, Deep Blue, and Stephen Hawking, along with former Vice President Al Gore. Zoidberg is a success. At least as much of a success as a giant lobster living in a dumpster and eating garbage can have. 
But as crazy as it sounds, this is confirmed in the show. Farnsworth and Zoidberg met when working for Mom to capture a Yeti, and the reason Zoidberg was employed at Planet Express was because Farnsworth wanted the man nearby in case he displayed any symptoms, stating he wanted a quicker death than the men that fought with him. So stay with me until the symptoms start. When Zoidberg goes to Mom for the head of the Yeti years later, she asked him if he ever regretted not working for her over Farnsworth. She states he could have been rich beyond his wildest dreams and had plenty of people working for him and respecting him, but Zoidberg gave it up because his friendship with Farnsworth meant more. Not to mention there are a few times in the series that it's pointed out Zoidberg does well treating aliens. He just has issues with handling humans. Plus, we have to give Zoidberg a lot of props for being able to leave his home planet to make a life and career on Earth. Even with the advancements in medicine helping him out, he accomplished a lot, such as saving Fry by attaching his head to Amy, bringing Hermes back from his robot body, saving the professor from being turned into a Yeti, and being able to transplant a human spine. And not every doctor alien is going to be respected enough to be called on to work a military mash unit. Speaking of, the nurse that aided Zoidberg in that episode declared that the lobster had twice the medical training that the other doctor had. The Unbendable Girders Reddit user Flagnut1 presented something compelling. The unbendable girders are only unbendable due to how they are labeled. The user points out that the girders are never stated to be made of any item that is known to be unbreakable or unbendable. Instead, they're regular iron. What would make more sense is if the printing was on there as a safety precaution. At the beginning of the episode, Bender is bending everything in his sleep, from plants to office supplies to people, because his need to fulfill his programming wasn't being met in his current lifestyle. He's a menace to every straight person in the company. But if the girders are labeled to prevent rampant benders, how was Bender able to do it? The theory states that this would be due to the events of the pilot episode, where Bender becomes corrupted due to the shock he took when helping Fry. This also gained some ground when Bender's son Ben attempts to be like his father, even dreaming of going to a top bending school. The only thing that stood in his way was his programming. When they get the card for Ben and put it in where his memory slot had been, Ben is able to bend as well as his father, showing that he had the ability the whole time, but had been unable to go against what his programming was telling him. As for the supposed unbendable girders used in the Robot Olympics, during the wrestling matches, people don't value robot life and are willing to see them tear each other apart or cheat if it means they'll get a good show out of it. It's likely that the Olympian's programming was changed or that there was other cheating involved. Fry's worms left a lasting impression. When Fry becomes infected with parasites after eating a gas station sandwich, the parasites improve Fry's life. They help make him stronger, faster, more intelligent, and ultimately help Fry gain Leela's attention. But when Fry becomes worried that Leela only loves him for what the worms made him into, he decides to get rid of them, and their absence is quickly noticed. And if I kill myself, you die with me. What the people of Looper suggest is that Fry is faced with the reality of his own wasted potential. It's a heartbreaking conclusion to come to, and Fry changes for the rest of the series as he desperately tries to show that he's better than what people have come to expect from him. The end of that episode shows Fry attempting to play a holophoner, an instrument declared to be one of the most difficult to play, with only a handful of beings in the universe being able to do so well. Though it isn't a pretty one, Fry is able to summon an image with his playing, proving he's taken the task seriously and isn't willing to fall short simply because he's without his worms. Bender went insane in the mainframe during the pilot. This theory has been widely accepted. Though we don't see much of Bender before he gets recruited with Fry and Leela for Planet Express, the robot doesn't come off as the vulgar con artist that we know and love him as later. When Fry and Bender are attempting to escape Leela, who's driven to give Fry his career chip, they try running through the Head Museum and end up in a dead end, where famous criminals are housed. Fry suggests that Bender bends the bars to help give them a way out, and the robot's initial response is to reject the idea, claiming that they aren't girders, so he isn't able to bend them. But when Bender becomes violently shocked, he changes his tune and accepts the task. 
You make a persuasive argument, Fry. When things settle down, Bender tries to pickpocket Leela, which is the first time we see him do this despite having plenty of chances to rob Fry earlier. It's believed Bender was affected by his surroundings as he was reprogrammed by the shock, taking on the behavior of a criminal. We mentioned in a previous listing that Bender feels a great attachment to Leela and Fry, and likely involved them in his plans to rule the universe. This would be a good piece of evidence to support that idea, as what better way to thank the people that led to you being a successful con than to have them rule with you. The vending machine kept Fry alive. Reddit user Law Angel gives a bittersweet speculation on the role of the vending machine in the episode Insane in the Mainframe. After Fry's mistaken as a robot, he's sent to an asylum for criminally insane robots that suffered from all sorts of disorders and malfunctions. During a visit, Fry's on the brink of madness as he talks with his friends, stating that the only reason he was able to survive was that the vending machine kept spitting out food. I would have starved to death if not for that sick vending machine robot. The idea is while everyone accepted Fry was an unusual robot, the vending machine knew that Fry was human and was doing something kind in order to help keep him alive. A vending machine giving away free snacks would typically be easy to repair, but the machine was labeled as having a deeper issue with its mental state. It's likely it was just too kind and didn't want to charge anyone for the snacks, and going against its programming is what had the machine marked as insane. And that's everything! What do you think? Which of these theories seems the most likely to be true? Let us know in the comments section below! Make sure to check out our other Futurama Good to Evil episode, and let us know which cartoon we should feature in BS to Truth Bomb next. But most importantly, stay wicked.